Aloha, and welcome to The Genie Show. My name is Jeannie Joseph, and I'm an adjunct professor at Chaminade University. And I have a great show for you tonight and a great guest. I have Dr. Jeremy Roberts, and he is a board-certified psychiatrist. He completed medical school in Milwaukee at the Medical College of Wisconsin, and he did his psychiatry residency at Tufts University in Boston, Massachusetts. And he's been here in Hawaii for two years, and he's doing some very innovative work in the field of depression. I uh, can't wait to hear all about the exciting work that he's doing. So thank you for being on the show. Thanks for having me. So let's talk a little bit. Of what are the stats? How many people are depressed in this country? About 10% of the population. Okay. Uh, it appears a little bit less in some populations, particularly um, those of Asian descent seem to have a little bit less higher in, in some areas. Um, I believe Native Islanders may have a slightly higher rate of depression. Mm -hmm. um, but a significant problem for a, a large majority, of the, not majority, but a large portion of the population. Yeah, that's a lot of people. And a, a lot of these people are being treated by drugs, right? They're being medicated for depression? Uh, a number, a good number of them are. Yes. Uh, many of them go untreated okay. and will live with their depression in some manner and it, it, it becomes problematic for them. Um, but never get, receive treatment. Uh, another subsection will be treated by medications. Another subsection from there will be treated by medications, not have success and be on another medication. Right. Uh, subsection from that will fail those and uh -huh. be placed on another medication. And eventually it comes to a point where the patient population that's being treated and is going through the system comes to a point where they get a certain degree of diminishing returns. And that's usually where I come into play. Okay. Um, I'm usually a referral source, or sometimes patients come to me directly as kind of the person that they go to when medications aren't working, or as an adjunct to medications when what seems to be going on right now doesn't seem to be working for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, the patients that come to me at that point are usually, as I described, kind of at the end of the rope, they're usually uh, a very depressed group of patients because nothing else has seemed to work. Right, they've been through several cycles of different medications, nothing's working. Indeed, uh -huh. and, and in reality, and we can get into this a little bit later, yeah. antidepressant, as you probably read in the popular press, the, the rate of, uh, of success with antidepressants is unfortunately quite small. Right. It, it does have some efficacy, but the percentage gets worse, and as you go through multiple trials, it gets worse and worse. Mm -hmm. And so when they come to me, um, typically they're, they're looking at one of two options. Um, one is uh, a subject in and of itself and is a, 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 of great controversy, which is ECT, or electroshock, right. which is actually very effective but has its fill of side effects and, and, and problems, which, uh, which are a little bit overblown but nevertheless very serious in nature. Mm -hmm. And the option number two that actually has come to the island as of about two months ago um, is a new technology that's been out for about two years. Okay. It's called transcranial magnetic stimulation. Transcranial magnetic stimulation. Okay. It's a handful. <laughs> yes. It's shortened for TMS. TMS, okay. And TMS is basically uh, an attempt to modulate the neuronal activity, the, the brain activity, but in a much more precise way. Okay, so you can target specific areas of the brain that are either low functioning or too high functioning? Is it? That's exactly right. Okay. And actually, it's, it's a remarkable tool, not just for depression, but for mm -hmm. brain research, mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, for uh, other treatment modalities uh, that, are, that are being experimented with, things like uh, chronic pain, yes. things like migraines, yes. uh, things like um, anxiety are, are being played with. Uh, it's, it's a tool that can be that's being applied to all sorts of uh, diseases, but the only one that's really been fully tested and fully evaluated mm -hmm. is for depression. Okay, well it's pretty exciting. Now what is it like from a patient's point of view? What do they experience? They go into your office, do they get plugged in, or how do they get attached to this uh, yeah. thing? <laughs> so what you'd see if you were to come to my office is, uh, is there's a machine that looks kind of like a spa chair, and uh -huh. there's a device behind it with like a little arm that's coming down from the side. Okay. And what happens is you get leaned back in the chair, and then the uh, coil, which is the part that applies the magnetic stimulation, is placed right over an area that we call left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is a fancy name for right here. Okay. Um, <laughs> fancy name for this part of the brain. For this part of the brain. <laughs> okay. And we find in a very specific way. We actually, uh, we actually, in the process of finding the right place, uh -huh. we actually go along... Now, is that the same place for every patient? It's defined in the same way, which is 5.5 centimeters forward uh -huh. from a very particular spot on the motor cortex. Okay. So what we do is we actually go across the brain one way, uh -huh. and we actually find that point where the magnetic impulses actually cause your motor cortex to have a jump. So you see 
the okay. hand twitch. Okay. And then we go up and down to find just that right place where just the thumb twitches. Okay. So that's a very particular place on your motor cortex. And okay. for most people, it's mapped almost the exact same place. Okay. And different people's sizes of their heads are different and they fit in the machine different and that type of stuff. So right. we find where their place is and then we go five and a half centimeters anterior and that's the place where we place the coil. Okay. So they're receiving a, a, a magnetic impulse, or what are they receiving? Exactly. So, uh, you know, one could imagine you could just put a magnet over the head mm -hmm. or, uh, or mm -hmm. you know, those big horse magnets that, right. you know, it yeah. could, you, you can't yank off a metal door for all your might. Right. This is a little bit different. Uh, you know, the basic ideas of electricity and magnetic, uh, magnetic properties says that when you have a pulsating magnetic current, you induce an electrical current. It's kind of like your toothbrush. Mm -hmm. If you put in your toothbrush, even the ones that don't have little metal connections, the magnetic, it's actually inducing a, an electrical current. So one, one electrical current is inducing a magnetic current, which induces an electrical current. So okay. you kind of make, make electricity circle in one place through a magnetic field. Okay. So what you're doing here uh -huh. is you're pulsing the magnetic field, okay. and that is inducing an electrical current on the very cortex of the brain. It goes about about three to four centimeters deep. Okay. So you're not getting much more. The magnetic field probably goes about the size of a basketball. By that point, you're too far out to have any significant noticeable magnetic effects. Okay, so does a person feel the pulsation? Do you it's feel a very it? good question. Uh -huh. So what they will feel uh -huh. is you will have, since you have an electrical stimulation that's being induced, is sometimes they'll feel pulling uh -huh. on their muscles, uh -huh. which is often sensed as kind of a tapping on okay. their head. A tapping feeling. Yeah. Okay. And, and most people actually say that it feels uncomfortable for the first session, but it's amazing over the next one, two, three sessions, the body acclimates that very quickly and that goes away. Okay. And then the rest of the time they're sitting there and they get pulses, trains of about 10 hertz, so 10 clicks a second, uh -huh. and then for about four seconds, then it's off for 26 seconds, and then you get four clicks, and, and then you sit there, and you do that for about 30 minutes to about 45 minutes. And okay. then you get up, uh -huh. no real side effects, you shouldn't feel dizzy, nothing bad should be happening, uh -huh. and you get up and you leave. Okay. And uh, then you come back, and about 20 to 30 treatments so, uh, of this, and it happens five days a week, um, shows uh, a, a statistically significant um, uh, improvement on depression. Okay, so 20 sessions, five days a week, was that four weeks then about? It's about four weeks, four mm -hmm. to six weeks. Mm -hmm. um, some people will see it faster than others. Some people have effects. Heck, I, I, I have had a patient who's had some, some uh, relief of symptoms in a matter of just a few sessions, mm -hmm. though you're not gonna get robo ro uh, robust results over that period of time. But. And do we know if these results last? Do we? Well, that's exactly it. They seem to last pretty well. Uh -huh. There was a study out there um, that basically took the people that had at least a 25% reduction in their complaints of depressive symptoms. So all these studies, they base it off of, off of surveys of, of symptoms. Mm -hmm. The patients that had 25, at least 25% reduction, they followed them out for six months. Right. And only a very small portion of them actually had a recurrence of their depression. Okay. And then on top of that, some of them got a few more sessions, like three, four. And when you count in the people that, that rebounded from just a few sessions of TMS, mm -hmm. the, the, total, uh, the total group that were depression-free or that degree of symptom-free at about six months out was actually in the 80s to, nine, to 90s range, mm -hmm. which is pretty darn good That's for an depressive treatment. Yeah, pretty darn good. That's probably better than anything else out there. I mean, I don't think the medications can claim that, right? No, not, not so much. Mm -hmm. um, the, the problem is, I mean, uh, the functionally, when you're looking at the numbers for antidepressants versus TMS, is the numbers get a little tricky. So when you take a, a major study that was thousands of patients, the government sponsored, it's called the STAR-D data. Mm -hmm. you, you look at the numbers for, um, for removal of depression, what we call remission. Mm -hmm. And if, you, if I took random person A and gave them a standard antidepressant regimen, which is usually something uh, akin to Prozac. In this particular study, it was a sister medication called citalopram or a number of other medications. You have in about in the low 30s remission rate. So mm -hmm. about one out of three will get better. Mm -hmm. Question is, what happens with the other two thirds? Right. So you get to antidepressant number two, mm -hmm. and you're typically talking in about the 20 percent remission rate for those that failed the last one. Mm. And that's with a heavier antidepressant regimen. So they change them, they add, uh, they, they increase the dose, they add an agent, or they switch it to what's considered a more effective agent. Mm -hmm. By the time you do number three, mm -hmm. your remission rates are only in the teens. 
Mm -hmm. By the time you're dealing with antidepressant number four, mm -hmm. you're dealing with single-digit di remission rates. Okay. Now, is there, do you feel that in some ways that people been through tri uh, multiple medications are going to have uh, worse results? I mean, like that the medications may have made them worse for having been on these different trials of medications, do you think? Few of the time are they actually worse. I mean, you're dealing with, by the time you get someone who's on four antidepressant regimens, it's usually because the depression itself is rather profound. Mm -hmm. But the, the way to escape this kind of, by the time you get to two, three trials, I mean, your, your chances of actually causing any sort of remission are, are rather remote. I mm -hmm. mean, I, I, you know, you come to me and you're on antidepressant number three, mm -hmm. and I, I hand you over this much more significant antidepressant regimen. Number one, the, uh, the side effect profile with each of these trials becomes more and more profound. More and people drop out because they can't tolerate the medications. Mm -hmm. um, and the chances of you getting better are rather remote. Yes. And you get TMS in there, and a TMS was studied on a group that had been refractory to medications, between one and two failed trials. Mm -hmm. And their remission rates in open-label trials was somewhere between about 30 to 40 percent remission rates, which isn't the best in the world. Mm -hmm. Again, there's a lot of study and a lot of research that needs to go into depression. Yes. But it's better than 10, 15 percent that might be from the next antidepressant regimen. And the side effect profile is, is so benign. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't get confused. You don't mm -hmm. have any systemic effects. Mm -hmm. And where I think this will really be cool that I'm actually really excited about is in pregnancy. Yes. Patients come through. Mm -hmm. They have a pregnancy. They don't want to be on medications. Right. And it hasn't been studied. TMS hasn't been studied adequately to make major claims in this field. But the magnetic, uh, the magnetic current, as I described, is about uh, the range of about a basketball. Mm -hmm. And you can have a necklace on and, and you won't even feel it bounce mm -hmm. or anything, even though the, the field is about one to one and a half tesla, which is like, a, like an MRI. Mm -hmm. And it's a strong magnetic field. Mm -hmm. it's, it's localized. Mm -hmm. And so theoretically, imagine if we could be treating depression right. without having to give, not even postpartum, mm -hmm. intrapartum. They're, mm -hmm. they're, mm -hmm. They are pregnant at the time right. and we don't have to give them medication, which means right. baby isn't exposed to a medication, right. mm -hmm. which means we've prevented possible sequelae down the line. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a thought, and it's only a thought in medicine. It's not near any sort of dogma mm -hmm. that antidepressants may relate somewhat to autism rates. Yes. It's, it's a thought. Yes. It, it, it doesn't have any solid data behind it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think most people would agree that if we can avoid pharmacologic intervention on yes. a pregnant woman, yes. it's better, even if, you know, they're B-rated, which is generally considered pretty safe, avoiding is probably better than not. Right. Well, you're watching The Genie Show, and my guest is Dr. Jeremy Roberts, board-certified psychiatrist, and we're talking about alternative treatment for depression, which is very exciting. So this is wonderful. So are you basically feeling that I think we've gone through a phase? We've gone through different phases with depression. I want to mm -hmm. have you kind of walk us through the history a little bit, but we've gone through a phase of thinking that uh, depression was biochemical in nature, therefore add a drug, or you know what I mean? Yeah. And now we're looking at an, an electromagnetic component, an electromagnetic imbalance, which could potentially be rebalanced by the right frequencies being introduced. Is that what you're saying? Or? Uh, basically. Um Depression has always been viewed as more complex than just, you know, too little serotonin. Mm -hmm. And, in fact, what we know about depression is far less than what we, is far less than what we don't know. Right. And it's human nature in science and in, in just in everything that we like to speculate on why it is that something occurs. But, you know, you take the serotonin hypothesis, it starts to fall apart when you realize that the efficacy of antidepressants is four to six weeks. And by that time, the serotonin levels within the synapse are about the same level as they were before. So the body adapts to it. So it's something about the adaption that may have affected it. Mm -hmm. And similarly, we've known before the age of antidepressants through ECT or electroconvulsive therapy, which has changed over time. So it kind of all gets lumped the, into the, the same old days thing. Was shock treatment, right? It was, it was shock treatment, and like, it still is one shock. One flew over the cuckoo's nest. It, <laughs> it was one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Now, uh -huh. once the, the age of, uh, of anesthetic agents came in, now ECT is administered in a surgical suite where the patient is unconscious, asleep, and you just see the seizure on a little strip, and they wake up. So it's a, it's a different thing, but it's the same idea of an electrical disturbance. Right. And from that data, we've, we've gleaned a lot of information that shows that a whole bunch of things happen in depression mm -hmm. and a whole bunch of things don't happen in depression. Right. And we're always looking for this causes this, which mm -hmm. causes this, which right. causes this. And that's a nice theory. And I'm glad people are out there speculating on the mechanisms because that's what brings about knowledge. Mm -hmm. But in reality, the